Greetings, loved ones. Today we're going to talk about when you can't collect evidence of abuse. Help us get these messages out. Please subscribe to our channel. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Hit the like button. Hit the notification bell. Hit the share button and share these messages with others because you never know. Just by doing so, you could save a life. So what do you do when you can't collect evidence of abuse? Court cases against abusers are bolstered by evidence from survivors, but what if it's not safe for you to collect any evidence? Ask any survivor, advocate, or attorney. Finding justice for domestic violence survivors is an uphill battle. Unlike other crimes, it's not enough to simply call the police on an abuser to put them away. Survivors are actually required to gather and present their own evidence of abuse and survivors of non-physical abuse, like verbal, psychological, financial, or reproductive, they face the challenge of trying to prove something that doesn't leave behind an emergency room record. If possible, collecting evidence can bolster a survivor's case in court, whether it's to obtain a permanent order of protection or secure custody of the children. We review some ways in which a survivor can assemble evidence without arousing suspicion from an abuser in our last two episodes. But even those tactics aren't 100% risk-free. Survivors might be monitored 24-7 by their abuser. Their phones, computers, iPads, even their cars may have spyware and tracking devices on them, preventing a survivor from so much as doing a simple Google search without the abuser being aware. In a recent survey, nearly 50% of 420 people who responded said they were not able to collect evidence of the domestic violence they endured or were afraid it would put them in more danger if they did. Another 15% said they did collect evidence, but their abusive partner found out and destroyed it. In a case like this, what's plan B? So, first, get out regardless. You can't collect evidence, not a shred. If you do, you fear your safety will be in danger. Should you stay with the abuser until you can? No, says Gio G. Carminati, attorney, activist, and author of the blog, Argue Like a Girl. I love that title, Argue Like a Girl. <coughs> she says the most important thing for a victim to do is to get out of the relationship to safety. Evidence collection, that can happen later. You don't need hard evidence to file for an emergency protection order, which usually lasts for three to seven days, long enough to keep the abuser away from you while you find a safe place to relocate, at least temporarily. <coughs> Pardon me. It may also allow you enough time to secure an attorney. You need to get one who has experience in domestic violence cases. This attorney can help you secure a permanent order of protection or file for divorce. If all of this sounds overwhelming, reach out to your local domestic violence shelter for help with safety planning, you know, coming up with a way to leave safely, and help with all the legal stuff. Shelters will often have experts on call to help answer your legal questions and help you secure an order of protection. So you've left, you're no longer being abused. There is evidence you can collect later called post-abuse post -abuse evidence. To help protect yourself and your children with a permanent order of protection against the abuser, you're going to need to build a case. But now that you're hopefully in a safe place like a shelter or a friend's house that the abuser doesn't know the location of, think of those ways to get evidence after the fact. Number one, don't discount your testimony. Your account of the event should be valid as evidence in court. Don't let anyone discourage you by telling you it's only going to be a case of he said, she said. If possible, find an attorney experienced in domestic violence cases and make sure you request to add your testimony to the evidence. So, document disclosure. disclosure. You can find a therapist or physician with whom you feel comfortable making a disclosure to. Perhaps it's someone who saw you during the abuse and can attest to your medical history? Even if it's not, this professional should be able to at least submit a letter of testimony to a court verifying your disclosure 
which can be a valuable piece of evidence. You could have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, and this can help your case because it documents the emotional damage you have suffered. I always request this type of evaluation in sexual assault and child abuse cases. And remember, the more details you feel comfortable sharing with this person, the better. Can you remember any dates, times, specific circumstances surrounding abusive episodes? What after effects, physical or mental, occurred as a result? Are you in fear for your safety or your children's safety at the current time? The other thing you can do is build a timeline. You can consider going to your local domestic violence nonprofit and meet with an advocate who can help you start to piece together a timeline of the abuse. Again, the more details you have, the more likely a judge will be able to understand the severity of the abuse you endured. If it's hard to remember because, you know, our brains can sometimes block out or fragment memories of trauma, try asking friends and relatives what they remember. Think back to holidays, birthdays, anniversaries. Did these dates set off the abuser? Is the abuser still threatening you today, either in person or through text messages or social media? All of this is evidence. The next thing you can do is you can find witnesses. Having people being willing to take the stand on behalf of a victim is important. But remember, having them testify that they believe you were abused is not the same as having them testify that they saw you being abused. Did they witness the abuser threatening you, physically harming you, controlling you, or abusing the children or pets? Also ask yourself, would having them testify impact your relationship with that person? Are they okay with being put in the middle? These are important things to consider. Even if you could not gather evidence before you left because it was too dangerous, you can collect and put together evidence after you leave, especially if he continues to harass or threaten you. Remember, at this point, the power is in your hands. The power of your testimony and evidence can assure your safety in a life free of violence. Don't listen to threats and compile as much evidence that you can to make your case strong. With one in three women experiencing domestic violence worldwide and 15 million children witnessing the violence, the question is not if you will encounter a victim of violence, the question before God is what will you do when you do encounter them? You could be the person who saves a life. You are called, we are all called to be champions for justice. Those who suffer violence, they need to know that those who love them and those who don't even know them will step out and reach out to them to give them the courage and the help they need to leave before it's too late. Help us get these messages out. That's what this is all about. Please subscribe to our channel. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Hit the like button. Hit the notification bell. Hit that share button and share these messages with others because you never know, just by doing so, you could save a life. If you are a victim of violence, listen to me. You are valued. You are loved. You are intelligent. And you are beautiful. God does not want you to suffer violence. He wants you to live free from violence and peace and tranquility. You're not alone. There is a way out. It is not your fault. Abuse is not love. If you're a victim of violence, please reach out to somebody today. If you find yourself in a dangerous situation, call 911 for help. And if you know of a child suffering violence, tell the authorities. In our next episode, we're going to talk about how to face your abuser in court. Until then, God bless you.